Hey, Chandler Roll here. Joining me today is Nathan Latka. Uh, Nathan is the principal of a private equity firm called Founder Path. Uh, he's the executive producer and host of the Top Entrepreneurs Podcast. Uh, he's got a he's got a Facebook show. He's got I mean the guy's got so many things going on. Uh, he wrote the book How to Be a Capitalist Without Any Capital, uh, number three on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. Uh, one of one of the the favorite and also most polarizing talks at Author Advantage Live uh, a couple of years ago, which I know he just loves uh, <laughs> the fact that that was a, a, that was polarizing. So uh, we're going to talk today about how to get a publishing deal, uh, how he sold so many books, how he had such a successful launch. Really, kind of unpack it um, for you and kind of how this relates to building a brand, building a business, like all the things um, that he's done over the last. A uh, year and a half or so, two years um, since publishing his book. So Nathan, great to have you here. So now that we're with, now that we have all your audience listening, you, you tell me what actually happened, which was, it wasn't just like, it, you told me, I think, oh, Nathan, that was a great talk, highly rated, but but highly rated because it was polarizing. I'm curious what the, neg <laughs> I'm curious what the negative side of the polarization was. Oh man, it was, <laughs> it, was, it was like, it was like, one of those where we polled and said your favorite speaker and least favorite speaker, yep. and you showed up a lot in both. That's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> uh, which I know is exactly how you like it. Yep. So, hey, uh, let's set the scene. For you, why publish a book? And why was that important to you, your brand goals, and your business goals? Um, I'm really competitive. I love playing games. I love playing games that have money attached. And I wanted to see if I could sell more than Ryan Holiday. Uh, so I said, I'm going to write a book. Uh, that, that was it. Uh, that, that, there was nothing else to it. Um, I also knew that uh, because of the podcast growth, there were publishers reaching out almost weekly asking if I would host their business authors on the podcast. And I always wanted to make sure they knew how impactful my podcast was in moving their author up the ranks on Amazon. So I would always take a screenshot before we released their episode with the publisher or the author, and then after to show how far up we shot them. And eventually they said, oh my gosh, you're driving so much sales. Nathan, like we want to give you a publishing deal. You should write a book. Who's your agent. And so that's sort of how it all started. Got it. And so then uh, I, how can you walk through kind of how you found an agent? And then I think ultimately, once you got an agent started creating a bidding more with publishers, like how did that process look like? Well, the biggest, I, I tried to think like an agent, right? Which is um, agents are embarrassed if they represent an author that they think the book is going to do really well and sell a lot of copies and it doesn't, even if it's masterfully written. Um, to the extent that you can have a brilliant writer, but if they cannot sell books, you are not going to get a book deal. It's that simple, which means you have to control or have a clear path to controlling distribution. And um, so I use that to my advantage. What I did is when this, so the book was published in March of 2019. Today, we just passed 24,695 copies sold. We did about 6,000 the first week. That got us onto the Washington Journal bestsellers number three. But, but none of that, that all happened because of all the prep work a year and a half prior, right? That was almost automatic, but it wasn't easy. And so the, the starting thing to get leverage uh, was launching a podcast, right? Because then publishers knew you and they knew you could sell. The second was, we'll see if you could sell a book with no agent and no title and no cover. So I emailed all the CEOs who'd been on my podcast. And the subject line of the email said something like, you in best selling business book. And the text said, hey, if you guys buy 100 copies and commit to spending five grand on the book, I will feature you. And I made up a page, page 37 in two paragraphs with a link back to your site. And we ended up signing many, many of these signed invoices. I think it's slide 31 in my Author Advantage Live slide deck. You actually see one of these signed invoices. And Chandler, that's how I got the next step, which was getting the best agent I could find. And that ended up being a guy named Jim Levine, who represents Sachin Della at Microsoft. He represented Eric Schmidt on the Google book. He represented Ray Dalio on principles. I had no business being signed with this guy, but it's only because I had about $100,000 in signed invoices, pre-sold books with no title and no cover. Wow. And so those, you said you sent the email out, you've got you, you, you asked, say, had, Hey, I'll feature you in exchange for buying books. And how many, how many folks said yes? Like, was there, was that simple? You just invoice them or how did you go from there to now taking this to agents and then now getting 
uh, this agent to say yes? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't simple, uh, but I had a big top of funnel. I didn't need everyone to say yes. I just needed a couple to say yes. So at that point, we'd already interviewed about a thousand founders for my podcast. And so I emailed a thousand, some portion replied. And I think we signed, ended up signing 10 to 15 actual signed invoices. And that was the stack that gave me the leverage to go get the agent that I wanted. Got it. And so then you have the agent that you wanted, then he starts shopping you to publishers. What did that process look like? And how did you create a bidding war um, to actually get the best book deal? Yeah. So the email, the e I'm going to actually read it. Um, the email that my agent sent out uh, to uh, a bunch of the, once we had the outline together, it was called, um, the original book title was just called New Rich but we eventually got to how to be capital without any capital. But the email that uh, Jim Levine sent out to Random House, um, you know, all, you know uh, Simon & Schuster, all these guys, this is what it said. It said, I'm reading the email right now. Just over 10 years ago, I turned down a proposal from a young guy named Tim Ferriss. No, it wasn't for the four hour work week, but it was by an author whose unstoppable drive was apparent from the get-go space. I think Nathan Lacka could be the next Tim Ferriss. And this is coming from a publisher or an agent who's represented the best dollars in the world. He continued, I'm pleased to attach a proposal with sample chapters for your convenience. Here's the overview. Please let me know if you want additional information or to speak with Nathan, who's in Austin. So that email that Jim Levine of Levine, Greenberg and Rostan in New York sent out, six publishers wrote back and asked for more information. We set up four meetings and three of those meetings turned into a basically offers that we got in a bidding war. Got it. And, and so how did you go from interest to meeting to bidding war. What was the structure of that? Like, I think I remember you flying to New York and having all the meetings in one day. And how did you kind of structure that whole process to get as many bids as possible and then, then to get the highest bids possible? Yep. So the first um, was Jim Levine, my agent, um, set up the in-person meetings. And this is exactly how you would expect these meetings to be. It is straight out of Mad Men. You're walking in to the Empire State Building you're going up to the 45th floor, right? At some massive boardroom, you sit there. They're purposely five minutes late. I look around the boardroom table before they come in and I see that their chairs are purposely higher so that they act like they have leverage on me when they're sitting across the table. Like it was all set up perfectly. So I was ready for all of this. And so we, Jim and I both knew that the question that all of these publishers would always eventually end up asking is how are you gonna sell copies? How are you going to sell copies? I don't care if your English is perfect. I don't even care if your title is crap. What is your channels? How are you going to sell? And so I had a stack of papers sitting in front of me, upside down. And when that question came up, I looked them in the eyes. I passed them on these upside down papers. And I had signed a bunch of extra of these invoices. Now, my agent didn't even know I was going to do this. But it played perfectly because Jim looked at me while I was pushing the papers to the publishers. And he was like, follow my lead. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? So the publishers then look at it and I'm silent, power of silence. I don't say anything. They sort of look back up and they go, you convince someone to buy $10,000 worth of a book that doesn't exist yet. And you just answered immediately. Can you sell copies? The question is, let's make sure that we create a excellent book. So that I'm not selling crap. <laughs> That was the issue, was create the good content to make sure that when we did print all these and sell them, it was good content. Mm, that's great. And I want to get into that, creating good content in just a second. So it, the, off of those meetings, you got three, um, three offers out of six or four or whatever. How, three, yeah. how did you then make, or was there anything, at, like, did you accept the, the best bid or was there anything else that you did to get the offers up higher or the advances up higher? I let Jim do most of the negotiation. Um, all I knew that I wanted in the offer was something where the publishers were incentivized to get me on cable during launch week. Because I knew if I got on cable for my book launch that they would want me back every month for the rest of my life. I knew I could sell myself to the producers of cable. And now today that has come true. I mean, I'm on Fox or CNN about once a month, which allows me to bully pulpit sort of whatever it is I'm marketing or selling or a viewpoint I believe about the world. And so that was my only goal with the publisher. Now to make sure that they took the energy and effort to get me on cable, you had to make sure you negotiated an advance that was big enough where somebody was getting fired if the book failed. 
right? Like it was going to be a major loss to the publishing company. Now, if you only get a $10,000 advance, even a 50, even a hundred thousand dollar advance, those are really rounding errors. Like the publisher doesn't really care. You're like a VC investment. They give that to 10 authors. One of them hits and it makes it for the nine losses. So mine was well above a hundred thousand bucks. And that's what got the publisher to eventually put me on cable. And that channel was the ultimate filter I used is which of these publishers should I sign with that's paying me the most upfront. And that is most likely to get me on cable. Got it. That makes sense. Why did getting on cable matter for you, well, for you, for the book, for your business? Uh, uh, because of video to me, I think I'm, I'm very powerful on video. You know, I used, I used at Heyo, I used webinars to sell a lot. Um, I think I'm generally an okay looking guy. Uh, maybe a little bit of Botox needs to happen as I turn 31 up here, but generally speaking, I can use that to my advantage. Uh, and I, and I wanted basically to unlock this new channel that I could add to my sort of marketing weapons war chest. And the book was the way to unlock cable. Love that. Yeah. And, and so using a book, and this is what we talk about all the time, using a book as a Trojan horse to yes. get into rooms that you otherwise couldn't get into and open up opportunities that wouldn't otherwise be open. So yep. I, I love that. So let, let's transition. You talked about, all right, I, I've already cracked the code on pre-sales uh, or not fully, but I've got enough pre-sales that I can get a really good advance and that advance and get a good book deal. And so now it's about creating a, a quality book that, that, people actually enjoy and read. How did you do that? How did you go about uh, the creation process? I think you did some speaking of the book. Like what did that process look like and how did you make sure that the book was great? So I thought what I was going to do was go like in the woods somewhere and like write this thing out for a week. Um, but I don't care how focused you are. Uh, like I, I sat down for like an hour and was like squirrel. Like I couldn't focus. Um, I'd much less get 60,000 words down. So what I did instead is I just created a Google doc and I started dumping salacious headlines that had to do with my life. You know, um, you know uh, how Nathan got screwed over by two co-founders who kept 40% of his first business. Um, you know, uh, how Nathan convinced a billionaire to write him a $2 million check. Um, why Nathan flash sold his company for a loss in 2016. Um, why Nathan believes you should copy competitors to out execute them, not try and create something new. And I started with a list of like 300. And then what happened was I just put that in front of a lot of people and whichever headlines people kept stopping on, those became the index for the book. That was a table of contents. And so that's what we structured the whole content piece around. And once you set up those buckets of what the index looks like, it's way easier to fill the buckets with case studies, examples, and content that is page flipping. Got it. That makes sense. And then, and then you, I, I, I think I remember you speak, you, you spoke the chapters and then got that transcribed and then went in and reworked the draft or how did you go from headline and kind of an index of headlines outline, if you will, to, to getting the content on the page? Yeah. So once I realized I couldn't sit down and write this on myself, I'm like, well, wait, Nathan, you're a podcaster. You talk for a living. Like you should, you should talk it. And then I'm like, well, wait, people always talk their books. It's called an audiobook. It's just, you usually record it after you do the written thing. And I'm like, well, that's silly. I like audio. How about I just do the audiobook first? And so like, this is how I did it. I knew what my buckets were because of the outline. And anytime I had a thought about chapter 10, you know, section two, I just record 17 minutes on it on a drive or a walk in the woods. That audio file would go directly to my editor. She would drop it into the right section and transcribe it and make the whole story flow. So there was probably a month and a half where we were sort of filling the index and at the end, I did multiple pastors of the book where I wanted to enter either a bold headline or a screenshot once every four pages to maximize the frequency of when a stranger opened the book at an airport, that they would land on a piece of content, a headline or a screenshot that would suck them in and keep them turning to ultimately make them buy the book. That's great. That makes a lot of sense. So you've got a good, so you, so you speak a lot of the content, you're intentional in the way that you're structuring the content. So there's screenshots, there's provocative headlines. It's compelling, not only if someone's picking up at an airport, but they're, if they're previewing the first 10% on Amazon, or if, um, or it's compelling enough to just keep them reading throughout the book. Now we're moving into kind of the, the packaging, the, the marketing, the publishing, all those things. So I want to talk title cover, uh, and, and a couple of questions specific to that. How did you land on that title? Because it's a really, really great title. And I, I know you mentioned earlier, you started with a, a theme or idea. And when you're pitching publishers, it sounds like they're, or actually maybe, I, I can't remember if that was the case or not, that, that you might not have even had that title. It was just a hook. And so how did you end up uh, at that title and, and why that title? 
the title was actually one of the random headlines I had generated for what was going to be in our index. And it's just the one that people responded best to. And it wasn't exactly that at the beginning, my editor at random house, Leah and my, uh, my agent, Jim, sort of we wordsmithed it together. And that's ultimately what we came up with. And, it, and it's very strange because there's something very powerful about the title because of the following. Um, depending on who you were, you heard what you wanted in the title. So if you were already wealthy and wanted strategies, you would hear, you would only see how to be a capitalist. If you were a student graduating with no money and you want to be successful, you would really see without any capital, right? And then the successful version of me on the cover and you're like, wow, I'd love to be like that guy. He looks happy. It's a capital book, et cetera. So this is very powerful in writing. If you can write in a way that are concrete examples, can't be fluff, but enable people to read what they want to read, actually read, but hear what they want to hear or internalize what they want to internalize. It's very powerful and addictive way to write a book and get people flipping mm. and reading the whole thing. Mm. That's really interesting. And speaking and, and, and I feel like it, it parallels to speaking and speaking well. And, and the most talented communicators are ones who can speak in a way where it lands to every person in the room because of the, they know the way to craft that message and they hear it. So that person in the back or that person over here or this person from that background, they're all interpreting it within their own life lens yep. and connecting with the content. Yep. Cool. So, so you've got the title now coming up with a cover and I know you were su super intentional. You mentioned this, um, putting yourself on the cover. Why? I, this is an age old debate. Do you put your face on the cover? Do you not? When does it make sense? Why was it super important to you to put, to put your face on the cover? I was two hours away from walking away from this deal. It was May 8th, 2018. We're 10 months away from pub date. And the email I got from my publisher was the following. Nathan, I hear you regarding not blending in because I said I want to put my face on the cover. We do not plan on letting that happen. You're right in pointing out the number of successful books whose authors were pictured on the cover. This is a vein of packaging that many get greats have tapped into. Even though it looks down market can be successful. And here's the catch. She says, you know, she's giving me the, the crap sandwich here, as they say, the compliment and then the negative. She goes, the real risk in putting your face on the cover is that you might alienate people who have heard your voice, but not seen your face. Those people may think, I don't know who this is. So the book's not for me. In my case, what I'm thinking, and so that's the email, right? Now I'm speaking. My case, I'm going, if I'm going to fight like heck to sell thousands of copies of this book and have them, you know, stored on bookstores and on airports and stuff, way more people are going to see the cover like a billboard and are never going to buy. I mean, I'm going to guess that for every one book sale we have, 5,000 people pass by and didn't. They saw it, but they didn't buy. So, right, if you take 5,000, right? Times 25,000 copies sold. That's 125 million impressions. What would you have to pay on Facebook ads to get 125 million impressions of your face or your brand or your last name? That is why I fought so hard to put my name on the cover. And I would never have gotten my name on the cover and my face on the cover if my advance was lower. See, they couldn't afford to have me not be happy and promote the book because they had a lot of money on the line. They didn't really have a choice. They didn't like it, but I forced it. And my gosh, was it the right decision? Wow, that's interesting. So you got, you got your face on your cover. Uh, you got you got a great, great and compelling title. It's attention grabbing. Let's talk launch and selling books. Like I know there's a lot of things that you did strategically to sell books. Obviously during launch, but after launch, what were top three or, or top few things that you feel like you did that really moved the needle from a book sales perspective? Yeah. So this is stuff that just takes time right? Because if you do things that are automated, they don't work. You have to do, you have to spend just enough time where it's not automated so you can drive your audience to take action. And so a lot of the stuff I did is, is I would tease. And what I mean by tease is if you guys go to nathanlacker.com, you will see my book landing page. It's still live even right now as you're listening to this. And at the bottom, you'll see, you know, this little bonus program, right? A lot of books have this, but very few of them actually work because the emotional triggers are not interesting or the bonuses are like dumb bonuses. It's like, you know, you know, come into my consulting course, but like people don't know you and they don't know if they want your consulting yet. So why would you give it as a bonus? What I did is I said, my lawyers blocked me from including five pages in this book. If you buy pre-purchase pre on Amazon right now and send me a screenshot of the purchase, 
I'll send you those five blocked pages. And of course, everyone's like, oh, wait, what, 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 like, what did, what did his lawyers block from the book? And so that enabled me to hustle my way to about 800 people pre-purchasing on Amazon. And then here's the kicker. I had all those screenshots of, of like their receipts, which I could make a video compilation of. I could put those in Facebook ads, but most important is I got their email and I uploaded those 800 emails to Facebook's lookalike audience and allowed Facebook to go find people like the ones that already bought my book to make our Facebook ads much cheaper. So those are sort of three strategies sort of combined in one, the bonus structure, the capture of the email, and then the lookalike audience. Awesome. And, and you did a lot of this via LinkedIn too. I, I feel like I'm remembering there's some things that you did via LinkedIn to, or it was like almost like a two-step comment system or was that exactly what you were just talking about? That's exactly right. I did most of this on my LinkedIn. It was my number one channel. It's also the channel where I know people have actually money to spend. I think my Instagram audience are, let's just say that, you know, average household income is probably lower on my Instagram audience than it is on my LinkedIn audience. And so, yeah, that was the messaging like, Hey, um, you know, we've written this book, I think page 37, the fourth sentence is one that you're going to read and go, holy cow, what's happening here. If you purchase and send me a link, I'll give you these bonuses. Or like you just saw, I sold my company two years ago. I never shared the price. If you purchase and send me a picture of the receipt, I'll tell you the price. You just got to think what people want that also correlates to your book. And yes, LinkedIn was my main channel. Interesting. Now you touched on something. I think you, you, I've seen you do better than just about anyone I've seen publish a book, which is uh, provocative, specific references to your book. And how did you do that? How do you come up with that? Is there a simple way? Cause it seems like you've got a backlog of five, 10, 15, 20, 25 provocative, specific things. And you're always referencing a page number. You remember that, or you reference that. And it seems like you're also catering it to the audience that you're speaking to. How did you do that? Uh, and, or, or how would you recommend maybe that other authors do that? And why is that important? Cause I feel like that's a, a very nuanced thing that most people wouldn't re recognize that you do that I know has got to just sell a ton of copies. Yeah. It's a, well, it's the same way that you have to write a compelling email subject line. Otherwise the email doesn't matter you have to get your book opened. If it doesn't get opened, it doesn't get sold. And so referencing specific pages juices up the curiosity level because people are going, wait, he, he, this is so important. He remembers the exact sentence and page. Like, well, now I'm curious and oh crap, it's not in the Amazon preview because it's one page after the preview ends, <laughs> which was on purpose, right? So like I intentionally did this. Now, by the way, I'm not like a genius. What I did is I took an eight and a half by 11. I listed the chapter buckets and then like the 10 most interesting screenshots or headlines. So I had 10, 20, 30, and you can't see this, but if you go, you kind of can. If you go to search Nathan Lack uh, Fox or CNN on YouTube and you see my cable appearances, you will see this paper in front of me. And when the shot, because I know when the cable shot is not on me because the light goes off and it's like on the host, I will look down, quickly pick like another relevant thing to reference in my next answer. And that's how I was able to deliver these on the spot accurately. That's great. You mentioned bulk sales earlier, pre- book deal. Did you do any bulk, bulk sales or bulk um, purchases post book deal when you're in the marketing phase? Yeah, we didn't do a bunch of that. Um, but I will tell you what we did. Um, there were a lot of people where I would say, um, like they'd want to sponsor my podcast. I charge 20 grand a month for that. Right. And the minimum is three months. It's 60 grand. But some of them would be like, I don't want to pay 60. Like, can I, you know, do 20 for a smaller test? And what I would say is, okay, how about we purchased, uh, uh, we use 20 grand and purchase copies of my book. And because you don't want that, you know, hundreds of copies of my book sitting at your office, right? You're not going to actually do anything with them. It's a pain in the butt. How about you email your customer list, right? And you get your customers to give me their address and I will send them all the books that you purchased on your behalf with a note saying, thanks for being a outreach customer or a Salesforce customer or whatever. And so that was a way to like not have your bulk orders end up in a closet somewhere at an office, get them out into the hands oh, of people. Interesting. interesting. That's a really great idea. Anything else you did like that on the bulk purchases front? Oh that's man. Super smart. Um, trying to remember what else we did like that. That, that was really the most impactful thing was, yeah. was cool. bulk order their credit cards, send to their customers. how do you leverage your podcast or even other podcasts to sell books? I mean, that's one way. 
but yeah, any, any, any other ways specific to podcast interviews on your podcast or when you are going on um, podcasts or media interviews? So marketing your book via podcast is extremely compelling, right? If you can create audio open loops to drive people to Amazon right when they're listening to the podcast to purchase, um, we maybe did 40 podcast interviews, so it wasn't a ton. Um, but what I will say, one pattern I saw over and over is podcast listeners would go buy our Kindle edition or our audiobook edition. And when I was recording the audiobook, I did that whole page thing. So if you listen, I'd say things like chapter six, da 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 da. Um, the, you know, the top email you should send to finally land that affiliate partner you've always wanted, but would never return your emails. Guys, if you have the physical copy of the book right now, you can see the screenshot of that email right here on page 37. For everyone else, you know, here's kind of how it sounds like. And there were so many screenshots in the book. A lot of people double or triple their average cart checkout value on Amazon because they added the physical copy after they had already consumed the audiobook or the Kindle because of all the screenshots. That makes sense. The other PR uh, opportunities, was that to sell books? Was that from a credibility perspective? Like what was the purpose of them? And then how did you get on so many? Because I mean, I know not only was it during your book launch week, but obviously you talked about this earlier, you've been back since then. How did you do that? And I, I guess maybe a two-part question of how, how did you get all those um, to begin with? But then how do you turn that one booking into repeat bookings? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you have to not lead with your book. What I mean by that is we took like all the headlines from the book and said, what's happening in the world on March 19th, 2019, when the book launched and figured out ways to weave me in as a thought leader to respond to current events. So like one of the things that we were going to execute that we, we never did, but I think it's a genius idea. Uh, and uh, obviously execution is everything, but because the book was how to be a capitalist without any capital, um, we consider, this is when the primaries were going on. We consider going to, you know, getting six of my friends wearing like Bernie, Bernie shirts, Bernie Sanders shirts, going to one of his rallies, having them all have copies of my book. And then having one of them light my book on fire so we could get a picture and a video because I was reverse engineering a headline that I wanted to give Fox, which was Bernie Sanders socialists burn new capitalism book, which would drive more sales. So like I was thinking deep about like current events, headlines, get my book in the conversation. Yeah, that's a classic uh, Ryan Holiday playbook. Yes. Just provocative media around the topic of your book. Trust me, I'm lying. Nobody is better at this than, than Ryan. It's, it's really incredible. <laughs> yeah. That's a great idea, um, man. Uh, so a few more questions specific to book sales. Um, or actually, we'll circle back. So, because I think there was a second part uh, of my question there, which was how do you turn um, one time uh, visits into repeat? How, how do you get to come back and back on the same shows? Yeah. So, ratings. Um, so, you know, in, in case you guys end up doing a cable show, let's say from a publisher, these are like the big mistakes most people make. Um, you have to talk in sound bites, short and sweet. Like, if you go on a cable show, and you only have a three minute and 30 minute, the three minute, 30 second segment, and the host asks you one question and you talk for three minutes, I can guarantee you, you are never getting an invite back ever. In fact, what you should be doing is figuring out how to turn the questions around and quiz the host on things. Cause they're going to go, no one ever asked me questions. Stu Varney's always the one asking other people questions on Fox. What if you ask him what he thinks about Tesla stock? right? It gives him a chance to speak. So that's what I did is, 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 is I talked about the book a bit, but that wasn't over promotional. And I really did a lot of things with the audience and the camera. Um, you know, I, you know, because the, the shot is like, I don't know if it's gonna be video, but the shot is, is sideways. If you're watching on channels, YouTube, the shot at cable is sideways. And I'm talking to the host like this. So as I'm talking to Stu and I'm answering a question, I'll say, Stu, you're right. But all of you guys watching right now, I mean, you know, we don't all have thousands of dollars to start a company with. So how do you start with nothing? Stu, here are the three things I recommend to start with nothing. And it's so like the producers would watch how I really visioned. I was talking to 
an audience, their audience sitting in Kentucky or Ohio watching cable. And so you have to, you have to care about the audience and the ratings will follow. And so that's what happened is once the first show on all these channels did so well, I got a producer's email because they'd reach out and invite me back on. And now basically, if I have something I want to talk about on cable, I can email the producer and get on the next morning, like ideas about current events and how I think about current events. And so that's how that worked. That's awesome. And I love the the catering to both audiences, which is the audience actually watching and then also the person interviewing you. Mm-hmm. That's super smart. Hey, I want to talk for a bit about reviews. You've done an amazing job at this. I mean, you've got, I think about at the time of this recording, about 500 reviews. How have you gotten so many reviews on your book? And, see, and what I tips would you have? Is that, see Chandler, I don't have context like you do. You work with so many authors. See, I have no idea if this is good or bad. I look at other people's books, they have thousands of reviews. And I'm like, why don't I have 500? Like, what are they doing? Some of them are just so famous. They just get them naturally. But I mean, I guess, so 500 is a good. good. Yeah, yeah, it's good. So all, all I did was um, like all the time I will get, if you guys look on my Instagram, people will message me and be like, Nathan, I just found your book. I just read your book. Um, like, here's what some of that content looks like. Um, and so as these people are messaging me saying like, Nathan, I loved your book. And I'll get like three or four tags a day from like random people around the world. Sometimes it's like other covers from Europe or things like that. I will always write back with a keyword shortcut that is R1 on my phone. And the R1 keyword no, that's not a book, but that's a thirst trap. But the R, the R1, there's my book. The R1 says, hey, thanks for posting about the book. Um, if you go leave a review on Amazon real quick, I'll send you back a surprise. And so I've just, I've used that R1 thing, Chandler, every day. I probably send 10 per day, three convert to a review. And I've been doing it for almost two years now. So it's just a simple, consistent strategy built into my processes. Oh, interesting. Yeah. What's the surprise that you send them? Yeah. So the surprise is a, um, is the one pager I used to raise $500,000 when I was 21 at my first company. Mm, cool. Cool. So there's an open loop. There's you're le- you're leveraging or you're taking, it, it's kind of like, I mean, we talk about this all the time. Hey, would you mind copy and pasting that into an Amazon review? But then you've added an open loop re- reward and reward. to do it, s- screenshot it or message me back. And then I'll send you something. Exactly. And that's, by the way, if you guys are trying to launch your own podcast, I do that exact same strategy to get podcast reviews. Oh, that's smart. So you, so how do you do that? You're on the podcast and um, you, you say, Hey guys, I'd love to, love for you to leave a review. If you do, I'll send you something. No, like people will tweet to me and say, Oh my gosh, I love this I episode. And I'll say, I well, see. if you love the episode, leave a review, I'll give you a surprise. Cool. That makes sense. That's smart. Yeah. Uh, how have you seen this impact your brand and your business? Like, what does that look like? So, so it depends, right? Um, This gets back to like my macro sort of level thinking about the world. Uh, We just saw what happened with Quibi, right? Katzenberg tried to spend $2 billion to launch this thing. He tried to buy attention. One of the wealthiest men in the world. It didn't work. You can't buy attention today. Trump beat Clinton and he raised way less money. Why? Because he's a master at keeping people's attention. It doesn't matter if you love him or hate him. It's the fact that you couldn't stop watching. And so like the point is you can learn some of these strategies and apply them to business in a way where you still care about people, right? It doesn't have to be negative and disgusting and bad energy, but I'll argue and put out ideas that I know are polarizing that people will disagree with about business in general. Um, And those things help the show grow, but you will also have enemies. I mean, Vox put out this nasty, nasty article about me calling me a con man because of how aggressive I am on my podcast interviewing software CEOs and asking for all their data, equity splits, salaries, valuations, things like that. The important thing though, Chandler, is that you force people quickly, first 60 seconds to either love you or hate you because no matter which, they will keep watching. That's great. Um, Now, final couple of questions here. Like knowing what you know now, what would your advice be to Nathan from a few years ago or a couple of years ago before going on this journey of writing and publishing your book? So if, if you were to go back and speak to that person or maybe all the other Nathans in the audience that are about to embark on this journey and about to write their book, what would your advice be? Um, have no expectation. Have no expectation. If you don't expect to sell three copies, you won't be let down. And you're going to learn so much from the process of doing it. I mean, can, Listen, the best communicators on Twitter 
they practice talking over and over and they're so effective at communicating because they practice it. You writing 60,000 words for your book, there's no better way to practice who you're about and your story than doing that. So don't get tied. Like for me, I was very tied to sales. I saw this kind of competition and it probably led to some stressful days and sleepless nights and unhealthy energy, but love the process. I also would say you have to care way less about what other people think. Like there are moments where someone says something and those of you listening right now who are super kind individuals that will always fight to make everybody happy. There's something you want to say in response that you know is true. And that I bet a lot of people would agree with you on, but you don't say it because there's that person talking to you right now that you don't want to offend. And so it's really important that you just remove that filter. And this isn't an excuse to be rude, by the way. I'm talking about ideas, business ideas. Uh, so earlier, care less about what people think and just don't have expectations because then you can't be let down. That's awesome. Nathan, this has been great, man. Uh, as always, just very specific, actionable, um, and uh, yeah, just awesome interview. Where can people go to find more about you, uh, and buy your book? Uh, where can they find more about your company? Whatever you do, do not Google Nathan Latka. That's L-A-T-K-A. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's, an art, there's, an art, there's a very negative article that's doing really good at ranking very high for my name, but it's fine because if you read it, then you fall in love. But if you want to check out the book, don't buy the full version. Go to NathanLatka.com. There's a free version that gives you 90% of the stuff there. Uh, and then I'm super active on Twitter. I'd love to help you guys out. And if you're a SaaS founder listening for whatever reason, building a software product, check out founderpath.com. It's a new fund we raised where we're investing in bootstrap SaaS founders. That's awesome. Nathan, thanks so much, man. Great having you here. Thanks, Chandler.